Good evening and welcome. My name is Sean Corsandi and I'm the Executive Director of Landmark West, a 37-year-old preservation and land use nonprofit serving the Upper West Side. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. We have many special participants that we envision uh, this to be the launch for a new multi-year platform for San Juan Hill. As you may be aware, June 2022 marks the seventh annual Immigrant Heritage Month and time to celebrate immigrants' heritage and contributions to the nation. And for us, San Juan Hill is a great proving ground for the Upper West Side to examine our past. I'm eager to introduce you to the project, but first want to thank some of our supporters who are integral in seeing this through. We're pleased to be joined this evening by Senator Brad Hoylman. Representing the 27th District in New York State Senate, Senator Hoylman's district covers much of Lower Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan, and this critical section of the Upper West Side. He has practiced at prestigious New York City law firms, served as executive VP and general counsel to the Partnership for New York City, was chairperson of CB2 Manhattan, Democratic district leader of the New York 66th Street Assembly, 66th Assembly District, trustee of the Community Services Society of New York, and former president of the Gay and Lesbian Independent Democrats. Landmark West is proud to introduce Senator Hoyleman. Thank you, Sean. Uh, it's so good to be here. Thank you, uh, Andra and Sarah, too. Uh, great to see everyone. Uh, congratulations on this amazing project. I've flipped through it already, and it's really impressive. I was looking at, at my copy of the Power Broker uh, to see some of the, the origins of, of what has uh, you know, happened in our midst. And as you know, Robert Caro writes, uh, 7,000 low-income uh, families and 800 businesses uh, were displaced uh, from this site. And of course, we know all about it from uh, what used to be there from the films, the film now plural, uh, the two West Side stories. Uh, but there really is only one West Side story. And that's what we're going to learn more about uh, through this project. And that's why Landmark West San Juan Hill project is so important by rebuilding not only the architecture, but the stories of those who lived here, uh, Landmark West is giving uh, today's New Yorkers a look, uh, a, a real look uh, into San Juan Hill and the life of that era. Uh, and as we all know, if you ignore history, you are doomed to repeat it. So San Juan Hill was demolished because government at the time didn't care about the lives of those immigrants living in the quote unquote slums. Uh, thanks to the preservation struggles of the 50s and 60s, and, and today, uh, undertaken by Landmark West, we now have robust community input processes codified into our law, but the burden of urban renewal continues to fall disproportionately on low income and minority communities. Hopefully, like the San Juan Hill project will bring greater awareness, uh, the work here will bring greater awareness to the fraught racial and economic impacts of those policies. So thank you again to Sean and Landmark West for this incredible project, to, to, to Sarah uh, being our guide tonight, and Councilmember Gail Brewer and former Councilmember Ben Kalis for their strong support of this project and really uh, helping launch this tonight. Thank you so much and enjoy the presentation tonight, tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Senator Hoyleman. And as he mentioned, I should note this project also enjoys the support of Councilmember Gail Brewer, who will join us for closing remarks. And our project tonight could not have possibly happened without the efforts of many other people. Among them, we'd be remiss if we did not acknowledge former Councilmember Ben Kalos, who couldn't join us this evening, but has allocated critical funding from the Cultural Immigrant Initiative to bring this idea to light. The project before you tonight percolated over several months and the efforts you see are a small taste of the culmination of a year's work, which we expect to be the basis for much more to come. It's been truly surprising and uplifting as in just the past two weeks since we announced this, public, this project publicly, we've had several constituents reach out to us, people who lived in the area, wanted to connect us with individuals who had, who we should interview and also some to share fruitful research tips. This project has started the discussion, and this is always among our main goals in undertaking this work in the first place. We hope to embellish our site with first person interviews in the coming months. Another impetus arises from the many beloved and illustrious institutions we couldn't imagine the Upper West Side without. 
From Fordham College at Lincoln Center to its School of Law, the Graduate Schools of Education and Social Service, to the Gabelli School of Business and onto Lincoln Center, from the Ballet to the Phil, the Beaumont to the Met, the Film Society to Juilliard, and the New York Public Library for the Performing Arts, which all currently occupy phase one of our site. Without calling out the specific entity, one institution posted an equity, inclusion, diversity, and belonging statement to their website, acknowledging that the land they occupy once belonged to the Lenape people. True, but that's only one part of the history, a history that too quickly and was too easily forgotten. Slide. This neighborhood was a bustling one with a longstanding record of providing shelter to many of New York's newest residents. These were a motivated citizenry who believed in the place and fought to stay in their homes. What you see on the left is the assembly of uh, some members of the Lincoln Square Residence Committee. They were also joined by the Lincoln Square Businessmen's Committee. Uh, and together they were formally challenging uh, the eminent domain claim as being made. Slide. But the wheels of progress were better resourced in terms of financing, social and political connections uh, in order to win out forever displacing the community. It's a stunning reality that appears radical, almost sounds impossible today, almost. Just imagine for a moment these factors for a massive urban redevelopment. Slide. Eviction of more than 2,300 families, removal of 1,300 businesses, the loss of significant buildings from churches and institutions, all for a project that was never clearly financed in the first place, and something that would result in an out of context scale of redevelopment. Now, I must confess to you, I've already intentionally misled you. Slide. No, those numbers were not referring to the Lincoln Square urban renewal area, which actually displaced more than 7,000 families and 800 businesses, as Senator Hoyleman mentioned. But rather, these are the modern statistics of the current Penn Station plan. Slide. So why do we look at the past, you may ask? Because also, again, as Senator Hoyleman mentioned, if we don't learn from it, we are doomed to repeat it. Too often we hear that the end, about the end of the neighborhood, its last breaths and its representation in West Side Story, only to be offered vague platitudes of what this neighborhood was without ever delving into its actual merits, its details, or even its historical significance. Today, we begin to change this. Slide. On a personal note, as a first generation American, the son of two immigrants, both who left their home countries at 16, one a bustling Middle Eastern city, the other a rural family farm in Ireland, of course, only to connect in a dance hall in Queens, this project strikes a personal chord and I'm ever grateful to the Landmark West Board for offering the latitude to explore this topic. Our project team involved many individuals. Our programs director, Andra Moss, organized this evening, our education director, Sarah McCulley, has already been adapting these findings for the elementary school students she teaches in Keeping the Past for the Future, our free elementary school program. Deb Schur, our web designer at Informivore, listened to, some, to our sometimes irrational pitches and patiently built and tested and then rebuilt the HTML, powering our online portal. Becca Brand, our graduate preservation intern who meticulously delineated all the elevations for the six missing blocks to bring them back to life and our many research friends. Sam Hightower, Director of the Office for Metropolitan History. Catherine Taylor Hasty, a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley and Landmark West stalwart, Tom Miller, the Daytonian in Manhattan. But tonight's lion's share goes to our lead researcher, Sarah Bean Atman. Sarah Bean Atman has worked as an architectural historian in historic preservation for the past 20 years. While receiving her MS in historic preservation from Columbia University, she interned at Landmark West. And post-graduation, she worked as an architectural con historian consultant throughout the tri-state area. Sarah was one of the founders and a principal with Long Island historic preservation firm TKS Resources, Inc., Historic Resources, Inc. And additionally, she served as chair of the Town of Huntington's Historic Preservation Commission, which she just rejoined. In 2015, she became Director of Research and Preservation at Village Preservation, advocating for the architecture and cultural heritage of the East Village, Greenwich Village, South Village, NoHo, and Gansevoort Market. Currently, she's the Senior Architectural Historian for TRC Companies, and Sarah has been on loan to Landmark West expressly for San Juan Hill. Landmark West is proud to introduce our speaker this evening, Sarah B. Natman. 
Thank you very much. That sounded really good, but I think it's more than 20 years now that I've been in preservation. Um, so anyway, I want to thank uh, Landmark West for giving me this opportunity. This has been really interesting for me to look beyond just architecture of an area, but also to understand some of the lives, particularly of an area that um, that that where the the research to date has not been in depth and we got the opportunity to do that. So tonight I'm going to start by giving you a brief background on the urban renewal of the area, some of which has already been touched on. Uh, I'm going to go into details about some the, the research that we conducted, um, which, uh, you know, um, which populated the beautiful website that Landmark West created. Um, we, I'm also going to touch on a couple of the building stories of San Juan Hill. This is something that we will keep expanding on. We've created a few stories which are on the website right now. I'll touch on a couple of them tonight. And then um, finally, I'm going to talk to you about what some of the research stories that I would like to explore next um, to, um, to, again, get a better understanding of this incredible area. Um, so now we start with um, the background, again, with the urban renewal. This has been touched on, so I'll be brief with this. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the story of how this area was developed into what is now Lincoln Center and the Fordham University campus, under Robert Moses, this urban renewal plan demolished six, I'm sorry, 18 city blocks on the Upper West Side um, of not just residential and commercial structures, but also numerous institutions, educational and religious. Um, here we show our study area, which is just six of the 18 blocks. By the late 1950s, the Metropolitan Opera was looking to expand beyond what its home, beyond its home on 39th Street could, pro could provide. Uh, Fordham University in the Bronx was looking to create an additional campus in Manhattan, and the New York Philharmonic was about to be forced from Carnegie Hall. Um, they turned to Robert Moses and his committee on slum, and his, he and his committee on slum clearance exercised eminent domain, con condemned the area known then as San Juan Hill. Um, as a slum and by 1959 had cleared the area for construction to accommodate the three institutions. Um, and here, these are the aerial photographs. 1951 shows this pre-demolition and then this is the aerial photograph from 1996. Um, so um, as a first approach to the project, uh, when we read the writings on San Juan Hill, the area was defined very generally as having an African-American community to the west of Amsterdam Avenue, being primarily Irish immigrants to the east of Amsterdam Avenue. And during the post-World War II period, there was an influx of Puerto Rican immigrants which would occupy the area. And while these generalizations are true, we found through our research that in fact, the immigrant story of the area to the east of Amsterdam Avenue was a lot more complex than that. There were a number of countries represented in the area, Granted, most, most of them were European descent, but it was much more varied than just primarily Irish. There was a significant German presence. There was also English, Scandinavian, French, Spanish. Um, as we move further into the 20th century, there were also Eastern European countries, Austria, Hungary, Russia, Greece, Turkey. There were a number of Filipino immigrants in the area and Asian immigrants as well. Um, the other thing that was surprising to me um, in the research, the census research and the architectural research, which I'm about to present, um, is that um, the area for the most part stayed consistent over the 50 years of data that we gathered in terms of we didn't see the majority become American born. I expected that kind of tradition in looking at 50 years. And for the most part, it stays 50-50 between native born and immigrant born during that 50 year time frame. So now we'll move on to the, um, the architectural research of the area. Um, so this is the area, the study area in 1955, according to the 1955 map. And this is what we created our database from. We identified each building seen in this map since that gives us a snapshot of the area just prior to its demolition. For each building we identified where we could, architect, build date, owner at the time of construction, original use, 
Um, thanks to the Municipal Archives 1940s tax photos collection, we were also able to secure the photographs of these buildings, showing us how they appeared close to 1955. And from those, we identified each building's architectural style, or at least the prevalent style, since they were quite eclectic. Um, then for each of the buildings seen on this map, we looked at the census records between 1900 and 1950. Um, you'll see that the area gets uh, initially developed um, between 1879 and 1881. I'm gonna show that to you in a second. Um, I would have loved to have used the 1890 census as well in our research. However, for those of you that are unaware, the 1890 census was lost in a fire um, at the, um, I believe the beginning of the 1920s, end of the 19 teens. Um, so we worked with the 1900 through 1950 census. It should also be noted that this was quite fortuitous in its timing because the 1950 census just became available on April 1st, 2022. So that was a big scramble in April where we were looking at all those census records uh, during that month. Um, but then again, we, we got a great picture of the area post-World War II. We counted total heads of households and lodgers. And of those, how many of those were native born and how many were foreign born? And then we also identified the countries that we saw. Um, so the Upper West Side was largely undeveloped during the 19th century, but that would change with the opening of the elevated railroad in June of 1879 along 9th Avenue, later known as Columbus Avenue. The map on the left shows the study area in 1879, and you can see the tracks indicated along 9th Avenue on the right-hand side of that map. The gray squares show what were probably row houses or freestanding houses. We see those on the north side of 61st Street and the south side of 63rd Street. And there's also some scattered in a few other places in the area. You can see only one institution at that time uh, on uh, the corner of West 61st Street and Amsterdam Avenue. That's the New York Infant Asylum, later the site of Powers Memorial Academy. And here is the study area just 12 years later in 1891. And the development is really remarkable. If you are new to these fire insurance maps, which you see on the right-hand side, uh, which are available through New York Public Library on their website and also uh, through the Milstein Room, um, the red indicates masonry buildings and yellow indicates um, wood frame. So in researching the original construction of buildings that no longer exist, unfortunately, with the erasure of the lots and the combining of the blocks that, that made up this development, it makes it very difficult to find new building permits for those non-extent buildings through the New York City Department of Buildings, which is where I would typically go if I had an existing lot where uh, a building before an existing building was torn down, I still should be able to go through the Department of Buildings and find that information on the previous building quite easily. Um, but when you have this, um, this, this combining of blocks and lots, um, you, you have to go a different route. So um, in order to find those original build dates and architects, that's what we did. And we, um, again, we had some very definitive dates between 1879 and 1891, when the majority of the area was initially developed. And we looked at the real estate record and builder's guide within those years. Um, the real estate record and builder's guide was a weekly publication, first published in 1868. This is actually the first um, issue. Um, in addition to articles regarding the building industry at the time, it also included conveyances, mortgages, and permits, and they are indexed by street for every six months of the issues. So we were then able to look up those streets in our study areas within the years that I defined in the indexes during that initial development period. And we were able to find a number of the new building permits for the buildings in our study area, thus identifying building date, architect, owner, and original use. Um, here is an example right here at uh, 21 to 35 Amsterdam Avenue, 163 West 60th Street and 158 West 61st Street. Um, there are three entries for a total of 10 buildings here in the Real Estate Record and Builders Guide. Um, and to construct the multifamily residential buildings with storefronts on the first floors of the buildings that were fronting Amsterdam Avenue, or then it was 10th Avenue. You can see in the entries that they don't include street numbers. So um, if you look at the bottom one, uh, 60th Street here, 
Um, let me translate for the, you what that's saying. It says um, uh, 60th Street on the north side, NS, meaning north side, um, and 61st Street on the south side, 100 feet east of 10th Avenue, two, one on each street, five-story brick tenements, 25 feet wide by 84.6 feet deep with tin roofs at a cost of $22,000 each. The owner of this development was James H. Havens and the architect was Ralph S. Townsend. Uh, the 1940s tax photos of these buildings show that they were designed in the neo grec style, which was common style um, from this time applied to tenements. Townsend was one of the city's foremost architects at the time of fashionable hotels and apartment houses. He established his architectural practice in 1881 and, and his stores, lofts, hotels and apartment buildings are part of a number of New York City landmark historic districts, including the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension, Ladies Mile, uh, Greenwich Village um, and uh, a number of others. Um, he, um, he, in 1906, he joined with Charles Steinel and William Cook Haskell to form the firm of Townsend, Steinel and Haskell. They also uh, produced a number of buildings, which we still today see today in our New York City districts. He was a member of the Architectural League and associate member of the American Art Society. Um, here's another example at uh, 136 to 144 West 65th Street. The real estate record and builder's guide shows the permit for five row houses on the south side of 65th Street, 378 feet from 10th Avenue, each four stories in height with basements and clad in stone. Um, again, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the maps, uh, the brown indicates stone at the facade of, on the map. Um, they were 20 feet by 56 feet with tin roofs at a cost of $18,000. The owners were the were JBE and W. Fuller of Brooklyn and the architecture firm was Schneider and Herter. Um, by the way, if you're wondering how we figured out the correct row houses on the map without the street numbers indicated, you'll notice that on the map, if you can see it on your computers, that the lot depths and widths are indicated. So it was a matter of applying a little mathematics, which is not my strongest suit, but we were able to add up the lot sizes from 10th Avenue or Amsterdam Avenue, working east to identify those five row houses. Um, you can see in the 1940s tax photos, how eclectic the styles were on these houses and really quite beautiful. Uh, there are elements of the Queen Anne style, Romanesque revival, revival uh, French Second Empire, um, architects Ernst Schneider and Henry Herter were both German immigrants. They formed their partnership in 1887. It would last for nearly 20 years. They too designed a number of buildings which are part of New York City landmarks. They were also known for their synagogues. Uh, they designed a number in the Lower East Side and uh, they designed the individual landmark of the Park East Synagogue on East 67th Street. Um, for buildings constructed in the 20th century, um, we could have kept turning to the real estate record and builder's guide. The, um, the issues are available online through a couple of resources. The one I always rely on is uh, Columbia University's digital library. Um, but it was much easier to turn to our friends at the Office of Metropolitan History and special thanks to Sam, Tau Sam Hightower for their help um, here at 114 to 118 West 61st Street. Um, is, uh, Gold, is Golden Hall. It was an apartment building that was constructed in 1928 and designed by the firm of Gronenberg, Luchtag, and it replaced three old law tenements which had previously been built in 1881. Um, here's the 1940s tax photo of Golden Hall and to its left, you can see what the tenements look like that it replaced since those tenements were all built together as part of the same permit in 1881. Herman Gronenberg and Albert J. Luchtag uh, formed a successful architectural partnership and were active in the first decades of the 20th century. The firm specialized in the design of apartment buildings and examples of their work can be seen in the Upper East Side, Extension, Expanded Carnegie Hill, NoHo, and the Greenwich Village Historic Districts. Um, so now we're going to move on to the second part of the research, which is the census research and then ultimately the website development. Um, so as I mentioned, in order to understand the immigrant makeup of the neighborhood, we looked at the censuses done every 10 years between 1900 and 1950 for each building seen on the 1955 map. And to give you an idea what 
these census records look like. Um, here is the 1900 census for 122 West 63rd Street. Um, on top of the fact that the handwriting was not always decipherable, it was common that one building would appear in more than one place within an enumeration report. So this certainly was interesting, quite painstaking research. Um, one colleague referred to this as the eating your vegetables of research, and I think he's correct in that. Um, here I show you the census data um, on uh, the spreadsheet we had for 27 Amsterdam Avenue, one of the tenements that I showed you previously designed by Ralph Townsend. And you can see throughout the decades that it stays about 50-50 between native born and immigrant born. And the countries represented through the years include Ireland, Germany, Scotland, Poland, Spain, Italy. Um, and then Landmark West would take this data, which wasn't very exciting to look at, and make it much more pleasant to look at um, on this website that they created. Um, here, um, some of the same information from the database that I just showed you um, is, is going to appear on this, um, on this web page. And you'll note on the right that on the website, there are filter options. Um, for the database. So you can do things like identify buildings in the area constructed by a certain architect or select a street or block and identify the buildings that say had German immigrants or Greek immigrants during a certain time period and or along one street. And if you scroll down the web page, um, that same web page, you see further information on the building, the um, architect, the owner, the census data, um, and you also get a present day map to understand where it was. Um, here is the census data that we collected for one of the row houses that I showed you along West 65th Street. This shows a common trend among the row houses, if you look at it, um, where they start as single family homes, or maybe there were two families um, uh, at their beginning. And then as the 20th century progresses, they become boarding houses. Um, you can see in 1900 that there are no lodgers. Um, and then by 1950, there are 27 lodgers in this one house, in addition to the head of household family. The countries represented by the lodgers include England, Lithuania, Ireland, the Philippines, Canada, Japan. Um, uh, so it's, it's quite diverse. Here again, we see that same uh, data now represented on the website that the Landmarks West uh, created, which it looks a lot better than my um, spreadsheet. Um, and here is the web page as you scroll down with that same information. Um, finally, I'm going to take you back to Golden Hall. And um, uh, here again, you can see the variety of countries that are represented um, by the different people who lived there. Um, this was built in 1928. So obviously, we did the census records moving forward from that 1930, 1940, 1950. Um, and I think it's also interesting um, that. Uh, how many lodgers there were. So usually with um, tenements or apartment houses, you could find some lodgers. This is people that were occupying apartments that were owned by a family. Um, here in 1930, this would have been right around the depression, um, that, um, that you see 20 lodgers um, in addition to the 41 heads of households in this. And again, here um, I show you um, uh, Sean and his team making this a lot more beautiful than I did uh, with, the, with the website. Um, so um, at the bottom of the website, I didn't do this. I didn't do the website in real time. I've run into problems with that with Zoom where all of a sudden it stops working. So I'm just showing you images from the website, but I encourage you to explore it. And at the bottom of the main page uh, for the San Juan Hill project is this map, which is another way to navigate the site. Um, you can um, click on a block, for instance. Um, for instance, if I click on block 1134, which um, is right here between 63rd and 62nd Street, um, this information pops up. Um, and um, you'll notice the gray box on the side. That indicates that there is a specific story to that building. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is something that we've started to populate and we're gonna keep doing so going forward. Uh, that's 70 Columbus Avenue and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that story in just a bit. And as you scroll down this page, um, you see these beautiful streetscape renderings 
Um, on the top is the streetscape along the south side of West 63rd Street. You can click on a building and it will take you to that building's information. The middle streetscape is the north side of West 62nd Street. And the bottom two images show Amsterdam on the left and Columbus on the right. The streetscapes, um, uh, uh, Sean, it mentioned before, were done by Becca Brand. They're gorgeous. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to get to what I just mentioned about the fact that we're starting to not only do we have all this like, you know, the eating the vegetables of data research for each of the buildings in terms of understanding immigrant makeup and the um, original construction information, but also now starting to build on stories of the buildings, um, institutions, um, uh, and even um, hoping to get into uh, what may be stories within the residential buildings themselves, although those might be harder to um, research, but nonetheless, I'd like to pursue that. Um, so as I mentioned, I showed you before the, um, the map that showed 70 Columbus Avenue. This was built in 1927. Um, it's had a number, it had a number of occupants over the years, which lend to the overall story of San Juan Hill. It was originally built by and for an automobile company when this area was still part of Automobile Row. Later, it housed a few federal agencies, including, interestingly enough, the Department of Justice, Immigration and Naturalization Service, which I think is interesting for this area. Um, and at the end of its existence, it would have a place in the story of the Lincoln Square Slum Clearance Project. Um, it was built at the direction of Inglis Upper Q and designed by Charles Burge. 70 Columbus Avenue was originally constructed to ho as the auto hostelry for Upper Q Cadillac Motor Company. Previous to this, the company was occupying six separate offices in New York, um, and the new 12-story structure allowed cons consolidation of the organization into one location, and the building provided a centralized operation for the selling and servicing of cars. During the 1930s, the auto company had departed 70 Columbus Avenue, and in 1936, the building became home to the Works Progress Administration, also known as the WPA, uh, which had previously been located in the Port Authority building on 8th Avenue. By World War II, the building was occupied by the INS, and the agency would re reside there until the area was raised, sharing the space by the 1950s with the Atomic Energy Co Co Commission. Um, out, um, so there's, there's a number of stories if you, um, if you look through the newspapers at this time, there's a number of stories about court cases um, at the INS here at 70 Columbus Avenue, including um, uh, the deportation of people who were identified as communists. That's its own interesting story. I found this one, which I thought was really interesting. Um, outside of Columbus Avenue, uh, this article in 1944 from uh, the New York Times, uh, apparently a booth was established uh, as, quote, the last step in becoming a naturalized citizen in the Southern District of New York. As each class of new Americans emerge from the courtroom, the members are urged to make their contributions as citizens by buying war stamps and bonds. Um, so I thought, I thought that that was an interesting article taking place outside of 75th Avenue, harassing new American citizens to spend more money. Um, Another interesting article I found in terms of looking at the research of this building, um, what, uh, linked it to the Empire Hotel at 44 West 63rd Street, um, which has an interesting tie to the San Juan Hill area. This, uh, the Empire Hotel, of course, is still extant. It was at one point utilized by INS to house deportees. And in 1955, a daring escape was executed by an unnamed alien using bed sheets and draperies from the 11th floor window of the hotel. Apparently the man used this improvised rope to go down about two and a half floors but, uh, before reaching a water tank. And then he finished his getaway using ladders. And as was reported in the New York Times at the time, um, the then district director of the New York INS, Edward Shaughnessy, explained that the man had escaped from a long term, a long prison term in a Western Hemisphere country, but that was all the information that they provided about him. Uh, the New York Times went on to report that Mr. Shaughnessy anticipated better security in the INS's new detention dormitory, which had recently opened in the federal building at 641 Washington Street, the result of a $17,000 conversion effort. According to the New York Times, quote, 
The new quarters will lack the onus of the prison facilities that has been used temporarily to detain aliens until December 17th, following November 12th closing of Ellis Island. Um, and the photo caption here shows um, another alien uh, who views the city from the ninth floor of that hotel where the other gentleman escaped. Um, in 1958, 70 Columbus Avenue and its remaining contents, including in an appraisal filed with the New York State Appellate Division as part of the Lincoln, Slum, Lincoln Square Slum Clearance Project, um, referred to in the report as the Kennedy Building, its value was itemized as part of City's Exhibit 185, and the appraisal was conducted by Henry Waltmead, Realtors at 60 East 42nd Street. And while much of the land of the Lincoln Square Slum Clearance Project was acquired by the city through blanket condemnation, the city instead bought 70 Columbus Avenue for $2,500,000. So this is a value of $62.88 per square foot, which was significantly different than adjacent properties, which were worth about $9.59 per square foot. And you may ask, well, what was the difference for this approach to 70 Columbus Avenue? Well, it seems that this property was owned by Robert F. Kennedy and three of his sisters, Jean Kennedy Smith, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, and Patricia Kennedy Lawford, under a trust established by an intimate of Joseph Kennedy and Democratic moneyman Charles Buckley. So this discrepancy was brought to the attention of the press in terms of the uh, difference in the cost and the difference about how this property was being treated as opposed to the rest of the San Juan Hill area. And in the end, Moses was required to have a new appraisal done as a compromise. However, Moses used his own appraisers for the new appraisal and it was executed by the same men who made the original appraisals. And so there wasn't much difference. These are pictures of both the interior and the exterior at the time of the appraisal in 1958. Um, so another uh, story that we have on the website is about St. Cyprian's Church and um, uh, uh, Reverend John Wesley Johnson. Um, in 1904, the New York Mission Society initiated, initiated an effort in San Juan Hill neighborhood towards creating a Protestant Episcopal parish to serve the Caribbean immigrants, the Black Car Caribbean immigrants in the neighborhood, and thus keep them out of the white Episcopal churches. The result was the founding of St. Cyprian's Church on West 63rd Street. Initially, the church occupied several row houses, which you see here on the left, um, at 175 one through 177 West 63rd Street. These were constructed, we believe, pre-1879. Um, and the church became a very important fixture in the neighborhood. From its inception, St. Cyprian's was led by Reverend John Wesley Johnson. Uh, J.W. Johnson was born in Virginia. Uh, on February 27th, 1866. He was serving as a professor in the Divinity School in 1905 when the Mission Society called on Johnson to start St. Cyprian's. He was with the society and the church for 25 years until his death in 1930. He also served as chaplain at Lincoln Hospital, an institution in the Bronx founded in 1839 for aged Americans. His work and that of St. Cyprian's not only proved invaluable to the African-American community in San Juan Hill, but also for the New York City African-American population at large. Um, in spite of leading this church, which was so formed to serve the Black community, he was an outspoken critic of segregating the races in their worship. In March of 1907, Reverend Johnson publicly admonished Reverend Dr. John R. Vanderwater of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church at, the, at Fifth Avenue and 127th Street for siding with parishioners of that church who felt that African-American parishioners should worship by themselves. Reverend Johnson was clear to point out that Reverend Dr. Vanderwater had recently attended a luncheon at the New York Protestant Society City Mission City Mission Society attended by African Americans. This report in the Times was followed by an editorial which stated, quote, it certainly does not seem Christ-like either on the rector's part or on the presumably Christian gentlemen which act as ushers. And yet um, in, uh, at the same, uh, shortly thereafter in 1908, the New York Age had this to report 
um, on Johnson. At Grace Church, Broadway and 10th Street, there took place a most unusual but significant occurrence. The congregation, one of the wealthiest and most influential in the United States, made, made its annual offering for the support of work among colored people of the Protestant Episcopal Church. Contra contrary to all precedent, but in the spirit of sweet Christian unity and in recognition of the splendid work which the Reverend John W. Johnson has done for the Upper West Side, the Reverend Dr. William R. Huntington, who in more ways than one has shown himself to be a true friend of the colored people, invited the Reverend Mr. Johnson to be a special preacher on this occasion. And apparently there were 1500 people in attendance of what the article referred to as a most excellent sermon by, Mr. by Reverend Johnson. The article followed with the news that the congregation of St. Cyprian's expected to enter their new house of worship by Easter. Um, so in the spring of 1907, as I said, they originally occupied uh, the, the row houses um, uh, on the north side of West 63rd Street. You can see them in the 1897 map. Um, then you see it on the map to the right. By this time, the, um, the, the church is occupying the, some of these row houses. You'll also notice, by the way, that the, uh, w, uh, the YWCA is here, and I'll get to that in a second. By 1911, we see the parish house built. Later, this is, uh, so the parish house originally was supposed to be here um, as part of the row houses. They built the new house in 1907. Um, and then later by 1955, and this is a little confusing, the row houses are labeled the parish house and the building that was built in 1907 was labeled the chapel. Um, the permit was filed for the, uh, what was initially parish house, later the chapel, um, by the Protestant Mission Episcopal Society, um, which was located at 38 Bleecker Street, as I said, in 1907. The brick and stone building uh, would be one story in height, 41 feet wide, 95 feet in depth, and cost a total of $30,000. The architecture firm um, assigned to this task was Hoppen, Cohen, and Huntington at 244 Fifth Avenue. Uh, this firm was responsible for a number of notes worthy buildings throughout New York City, including the former police headquarter building, um, headquarters building at 240 Center Street in Manhattan, which is a New York City landmark. Um, on May 20th, um, 1930, the New York Times reported thousands mourn Reverend Dr. J.W. Johnson. Uh, it was further reported that both um, Black and white citizens mourn the passing of Reverend Johnson on um, May 19, 1930 at St. Cyprian's. The New York Times went on to say that more than 40 black and white pastors were in attendance, in addition to the several thousand African-American attendees, uh, several hundred flower arrangements and wreaths were sent to the church to honor Reverend Johnson. Uh, the coffin was covered in roses uh, sent by St. Martin's Church in Harlem, which was led by his son, Reverend uh, John J. Johnson, uh, who was a minister. And they were also flowers sent by a number of other societies and guilds. And uh, Reverend Johnson was buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. And during the time here in St. Cyprian's, um, it was not only just a place of worship for the community, but it had a number of um, and provided a number of services to the community. There was a home for immigrant girls. There was a playground for uh, the African American children. There was it was a milk station for parents um, for their children. Uh, there was um, active men's societies and women's societies, um, and it um, to, and it. Um, was closely associated with a number of the Caribbean associations in the area. So it was a true fixture, not just for Episcopalians and um, not just for um, people who lived in the area, but for people who lived beyond who were in the African-American community. Um, so now I'm gonna move on to um, sort of touch on what is uh, what will hopefully be the next phase for San Juan Hill. And the, the, there's a couple of things that um, I'm already looking to um, set as uh, the next research for stories in the area. Um, the first one is these two row houses um, that actually I mentioned earlier, which were part of that row on West 65th Street. 
Um, and what is interesting is that here in looking at the census record, I spotted an anomaly to, uh, compared to the rest of the area. Um, a number of the residents were um, of Japanese, um, were Japanese immigrants throughout the years, um, including pre-World War II and post-World War II. Um, there were a number of lodgers and immigrants from Japan in both of these houses. And the, you know, researching um, uh, people who perhaps aren't famous or who um, you know, don't make the papers except perhaps in arrest reports um, can be quite challenging. But this is something that I wanted to look into a little more closely because it was an anomaly in the area in terms of this population in, this, in these two houses up at the north end of our study area. Um, this shows some more of the data um, for the people that lived there, um, all from Japan um, in, the, in the later census records. Um, another um, couple of buildings that stood out in the census record, which I sort of tucked into the back of my brain, but I definitely want to look into further, were these two old law tenements that were built in 1886, designed by A.B. Ogden and Sons for Peter N. and William H. Ramsey as part of a row of 10. Um, and here too is a, an anomaly in the residential makeup. Um, as I mentioned, the, the vast majority of this study area was white European immigrant or European descent. Um, here throughout the census records, um, they were solely occupied by African-Americans. Um, and you can see that in the, the census information. He, actually, you can't see it in the census information, but there were, there were very few immigrants and um, it was, it was um, both buildings were consistently African-American throughout the census records that we looked at. And it's in the middle of this, you know, again, predominantly white area east of Amsterdam Avenue. So this is something else where I just want, I think it's, it would be interesting to look at the people who were living there, what they did and see if I can find any stories on those people and therefore possibly those two buildings. Um, here's just more information on those buildings. Um, so um, um, as we move into the closing of this uh, presentation, um, I'm showing you a, a painting done by Raphael Sawyer, uh, who painted this. He was one of the residents of the Lincoln Square Arcade at the northwest corner of Broadway and 65th Street, which was built in 1902 and became the residence for a number of artists. Um, this story, I'm actually halfway through and will be published very shortly on the website. Um, and here Sawyer shows in his painting, The Dispossessed People. Um, the painting was done in 1959 at the hands of the Slum Clearance Project. And you can see uh, the, in the background, the, um, the man with the jackhammer um, disassembling uh, the area of San Juan Hill. Um, and finally, this picture, which, um, um, it's been mentioned the fact that that West Side Story uh, did some filming here, the original West Side Story, um, uh, after the clearance had happened. Um, and this is a quite a compelling picture, which was uh, which is with the New York Public Library. It's part of the scouting photos for West Side Story. Um, and I thought I would leave you with this image, as well as the words from a former resident, um, Michael Mickey Meehan. Uh, Meehan was a former resident of 67 Amsterdam Avenue, and his parents were both born in this neighborhood. And this is what he had to say in his oral history about the area from 2016. The streets on both sides primarily was all tenements. There were stoops four or five steps up to each apartment, and a lot of the residents would sit on the stoops, sun, sun themselves. There was always something to do. There was always plenty of kids in the neighborhood. We always we were mischievous. We also had Central Park where we could go and play. And we also used to go swimming down at the docks during the summer. And in 63rd Street, there was a YMCA and we had a lot of fun over there. They took great interest in the kids in the neighborhood. Well, I don't think the word community was ever used. It was neighborhood. You know, you lived in a neighborhood. And that's the end of my presentation. And I welcome any questions that anybody has. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, I know we have had many discussions over the past 12 months about this. And 
not to tip everyone else off, I still want them to go to the website. I know one of the things that captured this for us in our early discussions were about some of uh, the entities or the famous people themselves uh, who live there. And I know you've also already covered Lewis Mumford, and we've talked about some of the people who went to school here. Uh, one of the high schools uh, is where Lou Gehrig played baseball. One of the other high schools is where Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played basketball on the team. And this really was uh, a rich community. Can you talk a little bit about Lewis Mumford uh, and just maybe mention how this uh, being being here influenced his, his later work and why everybody who's attending might want to know who he is? Yeah, well, again, I encourage you to look at the website because we wrote an essay on Lewis Mumford since he is one of probably one of the more, most more famous people that did live here. He lived here at the beginning of his life. His, um, his, bio, his autobiography, actually at the very beginning, talks about this as being some of his first memories in living in this area um, with his mother and her family. Um, and um, he would, he would, um, he would cite it in um, his later writings in talking about um, uh, creating neighborhoods and environments, um, and th and this th the experiences of living in this area informed th those thinkings later on um, in his theories of the of residential development. And while I also have you, uh, one of the joys of getting to be in this position, can you talk a little bit about? Uh, What's covered? Like part of what, when we were tossing around the idea of this project initially, is why is there no book on San Juan Hill? Like there's no definitive book. How did this sort of escape history with all these loose references here and there? Is there, can you talk about how you went about uh, source research differently here? I know you, you talked about charting the different properties, but aside from uh, oral histories, which we're going to be expanding upon of people at the time, Police records, death records. Yeah, I haven't explored those yet, but that's certainly, especially with um, when you when you're not looking at the people who became famous later on, perhaps um, when you're looking at a building with, like I was just talking about, with Japanese immigrants, um, then you have to get into um, some real nitty gritty research. But when we first were approaching this, the idea was to identify what was the immigrant makeup of the neighborhood and the best resource in that case was going one by one through those census records. Um, jumping off from there, um, again, police records usually are very um, informative as well as um, some of the newspapers. The New York Age was one of the newspapers I, rec I um, mentioned that had a, a, a number of stories um, on St. Cyprian's. It was an African-American newspaper that started being published in 1887. Um, and that, you know, that will give you the real day-to-day um, -day histories in terms of women's groups and stuff like that. They were part of the community. Um, so those are the sources to sort of explore next as we start to look into the store, into the stories of the neighborhood and round out our understanding of it. One of the earlier uh, questions from one of our participants named Pamela uh, was asking, how did San Juan Hill get its name? Can you shed some light? I know we've had discussions. Yeah, about I know. We've had this discussion. There's a lot of theories about why um, it got that. Actually, what I was just talking about, Mickey Meehan, he wasn't sure if it had to do because of the Puerto Rican community that came in after. I don't think that's correct. Um, there's been reference to the fact that there were um, among the African-American uh, community, people who had fought um, in the Spanish, um, in the Spanish, um, uh, Spanish Certain war. Ones. Yeah, and, and so that was perhaps the reason why. There was also, um, you know, uh, 1910, there was, um, a, the, there were, there were race, it was a race riot during that time. And so because of that, um, the bloodshed over that, that was another theory on why it was called San Juan Hill. But I was just, I, I, I mentioned to you just recently when I was researching St. Cyprian's, um, the New York Times in 1916 said, we don't call this San Juan Hill anymore. We call it Columbus Hill. So there's been so many iterations in terms of what the names are, you know, Lincoln Square, Columbus Hill, uh, um, San Juan Hill, 
Uh, the reason why the New York Times was uh, changing the, the name of the area was to try and talk about the fact that it improved. It wasn't the race riot place you saw of 1910, but thanks to St. Cyprian's and some of the reform housing, which was happening to the west of our study area, it's, it's better now. And we call it Columbus Hill. So I, I think that, I think so many, um, I think so many areas which are not fancy, which are um, you know pedestrian work a day, but especially those that have been you know lost um, don't receive nearly the attention that they they should. And as you pointed out in the beginning, that's that that's remiss. And uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Tom, I'm going to put it in the chat here, wrote about the 68th Street uh, Station House, and that mm -hmm. sort of reflects part of. Uh, the maybe aggressive policing or the tactics at the time, but it also highlights this region because the, the late 68th Street Station House uh, was home to the first African American on the NYPD force. And it talks about his uh, relationship with the other officers. Uh, so it's really giving us a glimpse in time of what this area uh, had been. And it's very different listening to all this than everything we always learned about, right? Bob Stern talks about it in New York 1960 as the red light district. We always heard about it at the slum, as a slum when we were reading about it. But I've spoken to so many people. I've had this wonderful experience this week of all these people saying, I grew up on this street. Why didn't you show this building? And they were saying they were either innocent to it or oblivious to it. This was just home. And from what we're seeing, it looks more and more like it was crowded and maybe it was dense and maybe uh, over occupied, but it doesn't have all this sense of squalor that we've been, you know, this is not uh, something we'd be reading about, like in terms of the jungle or something. Uh, we're not getting that same aspect of of a really derelict gross area. When you were talking initially about this, you had talked about it as an extension of Hell's Kitchen North at times. There have been so many different names uh, to what yeah. this was. So what do you think the biggest strike against it was? Uh, it was just a convenient location that Robert Moses didn't feel would be, would fight back? I would assume so. I don't know that, you know, we, I mean, if you look at the other places that he sought to uh, develop or, um, and, and and did uh, the you know uh, Lower East Side the Bronx um, you know it's the areas where he's going to win I'm sure he wouldn't have done this in a wealthy area <laughs> um, so um, uh, that would be my guess I have some people in the chat uh, I'm going to try to catch up on some of these questions if there's anyone here who would like to ask a question or share a personal memory you're welcome to go into the reactions tab in the lower toolbar and raise your hand. We'd be happy to uh, bring you into the, the Zoom and you can ask your question or share with us. And I'm gonna scan this for a moment. Um, we have some uh, members of Amsterdam houses here on the Zoom. Fortunately, they can't hear. This is being recorded and we'll be able to, to share this with you and you can turn the volume all the way up. Um, some of the other questions and things that we learned about too in, in reading this was that some of the crowding was already dealt with uh, through the creation of Amsterdam houses, which is, as we mentioned before, will be part of phase two of this project. Um, so it's a question of if this was a, a problem seeking an answer or something that had already been answered, but it was a convenient location uh, for Robert Moses. And as we're gonna unpack more of this in the, the coming weeks, uh, there's letters that are available uh, Fordham University was actually renting space in the Coliseum, uh, which is now the Deutsche Bank Center, formerly Time Warner Center. And this is something that uh, was another Robert Moses clearance project. And he was trying to find things to fill the site uh, and it lured them through uh, to the two lower blocks of the site. So we have lots of things uh, to include. Um, Ivory here is mentioning uh, Horace's book, Horace Mungin's book on San Juan Hill. I didn't realize he had passed away recently. Um, but it's a fantastic book. It's uh, a, a bit of poetry uh, and a reminiscence of the area. And uh, I'm calling out here for, for Jacqueline Brown that they're celebrating 75 years of Amsterdam houses. Uh, the community is having an anniversary uh, in just about a month's time on July 30th on 64th Street. And I know they've been working hard on a new publication for that. Um, so hopefully they can uh, become involved as well. 
Uh, is there anyone who would like to share any other comments? Roberta, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Sorry about that. Um, so I went to school at PS94, and I think somebody else said they did as well. Um, it was on six, I believe 68th Street in Amsterdam. I know you're not, that's not quite yet into the study. <clears throat> But there were a lot of mom and pop little stores there and, and um, a drugstore, a little candy shop. And it was this very safe neighborhood. I, I was, my sister and I walked to school alone together. She wasn't always very nice to me, but we felt safe. Not safe from her, but safe from anybody else on the street. And Lincoln Towers was built on top of some of the um, tenement buildings and, and about um, 50, 20 years after it was built, all the driveways started collapsing because they'd been built over um, basement space and hadn't been adequately filled in. Nice detail, thank you. Um, I'd also uh, like to point out that there is one extant building uh, of, of our phase one project still standing. Uh, it's the Church of the Good Shepherd. Uh, and it's a Presbyterian church, and it's a church you can uh, visit. It's, it's more or less across from Gourmet Garage. Um, and it fought hard uh, to remain. Uh, they wanted to clear it, and the pastors there were adamant about staying. Uh, and that's a nice uh, relic. I'd seen something from uh, Chris Giordano asking about the institutions or other music venues that were there pre-Lincoln Center. And I can't find it in the chat now because people are feverishly typing. Uh, Sarah, I know a lot of these were ad hoc and I know a lot of them happened in basements and without permits. Uh, is there anything you've come across or in particular that you remember about any stories of, of music venues in San Juan Hill? No, just mentioned that there was them. Um, I'm pretty sure, um, actually what, what Mickey, me and, talked about was there was this one guy who the neighbors this is different than the music venues but yeah I did see mention of those but the the Mickey Mia one was kind of funny where there was this one guy where you there was like some sort of clothesline or something where you'd pass down a note to request a song that he would sing in the back of the in the back of the backyards of the houses um but um but the individual uh music venues I haven't researched yet in depth but that's a good topic. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else with a burning question about San Juan Hill? Uh, as mentioned, uh, we've just started the project now. So uh, you are welcome to further explore our website. Uh, if you go to our homepage, uh, there's a wrecking ball that's uh, on the homepage and you can click that and it'll bring you to the project. Uh, or uh, if you want to uh, very quickly here, let me share a screen. Um, this is the page itself. Um, you can uh, explore at your own leisure. This can take you directly to search the buildings by the filters that Sarah showed. So this is a slideshow that starts with number 70 that she discussed, which will show you several of the buildings that used to be on the site. This is provided to us thanks uh, courtesy of the Office for Metro History. And the one entity I was remiss in missing before is Ken Cobb at the New York City Municipal Archive, who provided the tax photos to us. So from the Con Ed ta uh, tanks all the way through the Phipps houses, Amsterdam houses, and these model tenements, uh, this is going to be our phase two project. But right now, uh, blocks uh, 1132 through 1137, you can click on each and every block. Uh, so, for example, if you click 1133 in real time, it'll pop you to the page uh, that's populated and you can read the stories. This is the Power Memorial Academy with its gym uh, that we mentioned about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And this is a, an artillery building, uh, an armory building. And as you flip through these, uh, these are the elevations Becca did. Literally, they look like piano keys, but you can click any one of them and it'll pop up with the building information, uh, the architect uh, and who lived there. Uh, several of them, obviously, as institutions, uh, don't have residents. 
Um, and as soon as you go through this search, uh, come back to the bottom and you can skip without going all the way back home to your next favorite page uh, and search. You can apply filters. You can look through uh, by different architects, by different blocks, by different years and different ethnicities. Um, so uh, the last questions I'm seeing here, uh, when can we see the west and north of 66th Street in Amsterdam? Uh, we're hoping for phase two. So uh, set your clocks for this time uh, next year. But keep checking the website. Uh, we're constantly populating uh, this website with more information. We're going to put it up as soon as it's available. Um, I'm reading from Jill here. I recall the Borst restaurant was on Columbus between 65th and 66th in the mid to late 50s, just across the street from the study area. Um, we'd be happy to continue uh, the discussion uh, in the future. If anybody has reminiscences uh, and other leads, please email us landmarkwest at landmarkwest.org. And we thank you all for being here. And we especially thank Sarah Bean Atman for eating her vegetables, doing all this dense research into the, the background, the history, the census records, which only just became available, the 1950 records only became available after 72 lag this April uh, and allowed us to get a clearer picture of what this area really was. And hopefully we can use this as a platform for other researchers in the future uh, to expand upon our knowledge of this district. Thank you so much all for being here. Uh, this recording will be uh, cleaned up and posted hopefully tomorrow and shared with all participants. Thank you again. Good night.